Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to welcome you all. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. I hope that you have your Bible with you. You're going to be using it this morning. We've got a great time of worship plan together, and uh, it's fun for all ages, boys and girls. I promise you that we have a special surprise coming up. Normally, at the beginning of church, somebody walks up onto the platform and welcomes everyone to the church. Of course, we're all in our living rooms right now or somewhere in our houses. And so let's just go over to the Jin's house and let them welcome us. Sabbath greetings from the Jin family. Take 11. Hello, I'm Jenny. This is our son, Elliot, and our daughter, Kiara. My husband, Frank, and our little Lexi snuggled up in Frank's arms. Our eldest son, Wesley, is not with us right now, but we wanted to say happy Sabbath from the Jane family. This week for our family devotions, we've been reading Jesus' Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes, uh, found in Matthew chapter 5. And we want to share the first seven verses with you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom in heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. On this Sabbath, may the peace and joy uh, of our God be with you all. Happy Sabbath. Bye. Happy Sabbath. That was awesome. It's time for some music now, and after that, our call to worship. Boys and girls, be sure to stay tuned because there's something special. We got a good surprise coming up for you in a little bit. Good morning, church family. I'm so glad you could join us. Please sing with us now. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all the precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Welcome to worship. Happy Sabbath to you. Let's read together from Psalm 46, our call to worship this morning. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray, church family. Oh Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your presence together from our separate places and to just know that we are together in spirit as we lift up your name and worship this morning. And we pray uh, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you'll minister to us in the ways that we need, each one of us individually. And Lord, may you be exalted. May our hearts be still during this time together to know that you are God. Amen. 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 Boy, those words uh, really speak to me this morning. Be still and know that I am God. Uh, you remember that old saying, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And you look at our world right now, I mean, not just the financial world, which is very real, stock markets, all of those kinds of things, but everything about our lives has been disrupted. Uh, 
starting with our routines, just like everything is turned upside down and, and it's try, trying to put things back together and make sense. I, I think of our schools, I think of our teachers and students and their families trying to make this thing work with distance learning, how challenging that is. Think of our healthcare workers, the hospitals, um, and, the, and the surge that uh, has been uh, foretold is coming. And we're, we're just praying for you. Just know that you're in our prayers every single day. Um, just last week, an earthquake in Idaho, 6.5. Uh, you know, you think, wow, talk about something shaking in Utah the week before with, a, with an earthquake. Um, there are those who are asking, are, are the prophecies of the last days, are they being fulfilled? Well, I think of the words of Jesus there in Matthew 24 and verse 8, where he says, these are but the beginning of birth pangs. So, yes, uh, the Lord has this in his hand. And yes, we are living in the times in which Scripture speaks, but they're the beginning of birth pangs. Um, will there be sharper contractions ahead, or will, or will we get back to normal soon? We don't know that. What we do know is this, and you'll remember this from a year ago, that our, our theme for the year was, come awake. Come awake um, in the Holy Spirit. Press into Christ Jesus. You think of that, I think of that parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins, who all of them were asleep. Everyone was asleep, and there was this, there was this wake-up call, come awake. And I think of that old song we used to sing back at the campfire when I was a kid, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. And that's my, my understanding, right? I've been asking God, what are, you, what are you doing in our lives? What are you asking us to do is to press into Christ and to have that oil in our lamps that during this time of the COVID crisis, that this would be a time in each one of our lives as a time for spiritual renewal. Be still and know that God, be still and know that he is God. And he says, be still and know that I am God. And so what are the ways that we can, ways that we can cope, Pastor Greg, as you think about this um, in this COVID crisis? I know we have a guest here you want to introduce. Yeah, we're so blessed to have Annalise Manns with us today. Um, and she's, she's not really a guest. Um, she is a guest, but she's not really a guest because she's part of our Pleasant Valley congregation. She's one of our PVC elders. And um, I was just thinking about how blessed we are um, to be so well resourced right within our own congregation and happy to have uh, Annalise joining us. She works as a clinical psychologist resident with Providence Behavioral Health. And Annalise, welcome. Thank you for being willing to come and share with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Let's, uh, let's start off with a question. You know, it's obvious that these are not normal times that we're living in. And um, talk to us a little bit about the stress or anxiety that we may be feeling and some of the ways that that might manifest for us. Mm -hmm. These are not normal times. And when the systemic stress that of our time and of our society starts to push in, of course, that's going to impact how we're feeling and how we're kind of noticing ourselves being in the world day to day. There's a lot of ways that this kind of increased level of stress related to economic changes, related to just fears around health, being disconnected from our normal social supports, all of that's gonna impact us. And it has a number of ways it can impact us, how we think, how we feel, even how we act day to day. So kind of observing how you're doing, checking in with yourself and trying to notice how, how am I sitting with these stressors of our time, how are these things impacting me, can be a really important thing considering all the added stress that we've been going through. How does the, how does the increased stress that we're experiencing sometimes affect our bodies? Yeah, there's a lot of ways it impacts our bodies. Stress and anxiety are actually supposed to be an adaptive response for us. Really, it's a beautiful a beautiful part of who we are as humans and how we were created to have this physiological response when we're threatened or when we're under distress that tells us, hey, like something isn't right here, you need to respond. Really, that's what stress and anxiety are created to be, a fear response. The problem is when that response is just prolonged for a long amount of time, 
it can start to have negative impacts on our body. It can impact uh, immune health, your immune system, your musculoskeletal system, reproductive health, it can cause GI issues like stomach aches, intestinal discomfort. It can cause cardio, cardiac health issues long-term and can then also cause things like tension, headaches, muscle cramps, insomnia, just an overall sense of fatigue and, and weariness. So let's talk for a minute about um, what kinds of resources are available. Say I'm experiencing increased stress and anxiety, maybe depression right now. Um, what kinds of resources are available right now? Yeah, the good news is there's so many resources available, even though these are kind of uncertain times. A lot of professionals who are typically seeing people in office have adapted really quickly. And so there's a lot of telehealth options out there, whether through your medical provider, that's how people can reach me by asking their primary care physician to meet with a behavioral health provider, or there's a lot of still community-based and faith-based mental health organizations in our community that continue to provide services via telehealth or video, even video sessions. So um, if, if that's something you're interested in, you can definitely reach out to our pastor team or even myself, and I would be so happy to, and all of us would be so happy to discuss with you how you can get connected. Um, because this is a time when, when if you are feeling overwhelmed, you definitely don't have to go through that alone. Then there's some other really good resources out there. Um, one is called uh, www.virusanxiety.com. It's a free website that is totally built around supporting people with COVID-19 associated anxiety and has some really good materials on there. So those are some resources that folks can access. Yeah, good. That's, that's really helpful. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned something called telehealth, and that may not be something that people have heard of before. Can you give us just a quick uh, ex explanation of that? Yeah. So telehealth is basically like accessing um, traditional therapy, talk therapy, or behavioral health support. But instead of going into an office or going into a therapy clinic, you would just talk to the provider over the phone and have that support without having to leave your home or especially during kind of social distancing, that's going to be really helpful to be able to either talk on the phone to a provider or have like a video session with a provider. So those are the things that a lot of different group practices and medical clinics are doing to try to continue supporting people, even while they aren't able to leave their homes. Perfect. Perfect. Pastor George, did you have something you want to jump in here with? If well, I was wondering, Annalise, for you personally, are there any scripture passages that have really kind of spoken to you, kind of this, this whole piece of, uh, of that spiritual support that you're finding uh, in your own scripture, your own time with the Lord? Yeah, um, I think that there's two that really stand out to me. I think the, uh, you know, Jesus is kind of just calling out that in this world, you will have troubles, but I've overcome the world mm. and I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Um, those to me just provide a lot of comfort because there was never a promise that this journey or that this life would be easy or free of suffering. In fact, there was a promise that there would be challenges and hardships, um, but a promise that we would never be alone in those, that God is with us in them. In the same way we can be with one another, we're not alone in this journey. And I think that there's so much comfort for me personally in that. And then knowing that even though this part of my story might include some pain and some suffering and some discomfort, the ultimate ending of my story, or really even the ultimate beginning of my story in Christ is beautiful and um, filled with hope and joy. Mm. Thank you. So good. Um, so just thinking about like ways going forward for us to, to, uh, to manage and to cope. Um, what are some things that we can be doing right now in order to promote um, better mental health for, for across the spectrum for all of us? Yeah. So there's been some really cool research that's come out within the last couple of years that it's not that stress itself doesn't impact us quite as much as how we actually think about stress. 
So the really good news is that if we can find healthy and adaptive ways to cope with stress and to think about stress, they can actually buffer us from all of those really, for, mo for most of those really kind of negative consequences of long-term stress I was mentioning previously. So there's some really good TED Talks. Uh, one is by How to Make Stress Your Friend by Kelly McGonigal, and it, she goes really kind of in-depth into how vital it is to have a healthy relationship to stress and think about stress in healthy ways, kind of as your body's way of just signaling to you that, hey, I'm under pressure here. Um, and then responding to that in kind of a caring and compassionate way instead of fearing stress, knowing that stress is here to help you. It's here to tell you, okay, I need to spend a little more time in the word today. I need to um, connect and outreach to my friends virtually. I need to, you know, take a warm bath. I need to get outside and go for a walk and, you know, try to count how many new types of flowers have bloomed, right? So the ways to do that are staying socially connected, um, using past coping skills that have been helpful to us or things that you've found to be stress relieving in the past, really, really trying to stay connected as much as possible. So, so that you know that you're not alone in this journey and you have the support of others to get through this time. I think all of those are really helpful things. And if you're doing those things and you're noticing that you still feel really distressed and you're not sleeping well and you're not feeling well, then that's a really good time that it, a really good indicator that it might be time to reach out for some additional support. That's great. Um, you've said a lot of things. So as we wrap up, uh, if, if, uh, if maybe that was coming at people fast, what, what's the one thing that you really want people to know in order to get through this time? What's the one yeah. thing? I think the one thing I want people to just remember is that um, even though our circumstances are hard now and we're in uncharted territory, nobody in our generation has gone through anything like this. Um, this is temporary temporary probably in our lifetime but also temporary a temporary moment in god's plan for us and plan for our eternity and that when we begin to go to get overwhelmed that god is with us and can hold our experience with us and is the great comforter so that it that no matter what you're facing, you can know that you're not in it alone. God is with you and we as a community are with you so that yes. you're not alone because God and your brothers and sisters in Christ are here to support you and surround you with, with love. You know, I've noticed how many people, uh, Annalise and Pastor Greg, I've noticed how many people have been coming on with the the different Zoom meetings we've been having with the Sabbath schools and, and with Wednesday Bible Fellowship. And and it just it's always fun to when you see people come on and the people wave and they say, Hey, oh, it's good to see you. It's there's that connecting thing that's going on. It's, it's such a blessing when you talked about the community itself being part of this. And then to community together as a community seeking Jesus Christ. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, Annalise. Yeah. Annalise, um I I feel better just listening to what you shared and and with those reminders and you're awesome. I, I feel, I always feel, uh, I always feel happier when I talk with you. So thanks for, thanks for uh, joining us today. And I'm also blessed every time you pray for us as a congregation. And yes. I, I wanted to just ask you if you would do that for us now. Absolutely. So let's just bow our heads together and we'll lift this all up. Dear father in heaven, we're just so honored to come spend some time with you this Sabbath and to just, First and foremost, acknowledge the good God that you are. We thank you for your presence with us in this moment. We thank you for being God with us, for fully seeing where each one of us is in this moment and meeting us in that space so that we're not alone. We thank you for being a God who goes before and fights our battles for us that we can trust you no matter the circumstance or the fear we're facing, knowing that you will fight for us. And that it, though in this world we do have troubles, you have ultimately overcome the world. And though we're in the middle of the story, you've already written a beautiful end to the story for us that will start a whole new beginning of life where every tear will be wiped away and there won't be heartache or sorrow 
to the way we know it now. And we just thank you. There's so much hope in that. And, and, and you being the good God you are creates opportunity for us to respond with hope and faith and peace in times when the world around us is responding with fear and hopelessness and, and getting lost in all of this. And we just thank you for being the anchor amidst stormy seas. And God, we just confess that there are times when we, we forget that you are our anchor. And so God, we just continue to confess our persistent need of you. We continue to confess that you are the source of peace in these times, that you are the anchor in the storm and we cling to you and we dwell under the shadow of your wings where we're protected, where our souls are protected, though our bodies may continue to experience any kind of difficulty. And God, with that, we just lift up members of our church family who, who need your, an extra dose of your presence with them and an extra dose of your healing hand on their lives. God, we think of Judy Doty and Judy Shaler, Carrie Nolsher and Jody Manns, and we also lift up Jenny Miller, and we just pray that you will be with each one of them and continue to be the healing God and doing a work in their lives and, and help them to know that, that you are with them and working things out for their good. And God, we just thank you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for technology and the ability to continue connecting together as a church community. We thank you for every person that is, that is fighting on our society's behalf, the medical professionals, the all essential workers, um, our pastors who are praying for us and continuing to minister to us and, and everyone in our community who continues to give their best and give their heart to serve and to love and to honor you in this time. And we just thank you for being a God who knows suffering because he lived a life of suffering and can be with us and fully empathize with where we are in this journey. It feels so, so comforting to know that you are a God that understands and so we just create space to be in your presence today and to experience the peace that surpasses understanding when we are with you. Amen. And we pray that that, ex that peace will extend on into our weeks as we separate. Thank you for your presence in our lives and in this time. Amen. Good morning, church family. I wish we could be together right now, but uh, even though we can't, I'm praying that you're all safe and healthy. And I invite you to sing with me now. And even though we aren't together, we can still praise Jesus um, from wherever we are. Thank you. 
Okay, boys and girls, I promised a special surprise, and today we're going to be playing Bible charades. And these Bible charades are done by the band family. They're going to be acting out some Bible stories, and it's your job to guess what stories they're acting out. There's three separate ones, and you're going to use the comment section to give us your guess. There won't be any audio. It's just they're going to be acting them out silently, and you write in the comments and say what Bible story they're acting out. Bonus question. For some of, or for anybody who wants to play this part, but bonus question would be what book of the Bible and what chapter in that book could you find these Bible stories? You guys ready? Don't forget, you're going to write your comments in the comment section. All right, let's go. Here's number one All right, that was the first one. Did you get it? Be sure to let me know in the comments section. And here's number two. What story was that one, boys and girls? Do you know what book and chapter I could look it up in if I wanted to find it in the Bible? 
All right, make sure you put your answers in the comments section. I'll be watching and I'll respond there in the comments. All right, here's number three. All right, boys and girls, that was number three for the day, and that's our last one. So be sure to comment. I'm watching the comments to see if you got the answers right. And by the way, if you want to share a Bible charade with your church family, you can do that. Just make a video and then get your mom and dad to help you upload it to Google Drive, and you can share it with me. My email address is pastorgregphillips at gmail.com. I'd love it if you'd play along church family, as we continue our worship together, I wanted to take a minute and say thank you for your faithfulness in returning tithes and offerings. We didn't know how the church budget would be impacted by the COVID-19 shutdown, but Dan Border shared with me this week that we met our March budget, and I'm just so grateful to God. Giving is a part of worship, and I just wanted to remind you that online giving is an easy thing to do. Just visit the church website, pvclife.com, and you'll find there a button that says Adventist Giving. It's super straightforward. So thank you again for your faithfulness. And as we continue to worship together, I hope that you'll remember worship through giving. I'm really excited about this next song. Our PVC music team has been working together to collaborate from our individual homes and to record a song for you. And so you're going to see Randy Ban and Hannah Wachter. You won't see Ryan Williams. Uh, he's playing behind the scenes, doing all the keyboard parts and the organ, and he also did all the mixing. I know you're going to enjoy it. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh, my dad left for dead beneath the wall. slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world And I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Miss Bye. 
the heavens as the space between where sin I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us there is no other name but the name All the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone And I know I will never be alone There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the sea joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire darkness bows to him I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's then I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us Isn't that an amazing song? Those lyrics are just so incredibly powerful. That message that we never walk alone. And then that line, there's a tomb that holds no body. Ah, I love it. It'd be a real encouragement to your friends and family. And we want you to share it. We're going to make it available on our church Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So I hope that you'll click share and get it out there to people to whom it can be a blessing. Hey, let's go back to the word. I'd like to invite you to take your Bible And let's turn to Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. Luke 9 and verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? I think this is a really interesting beginning of this passage for the words that say that he was praying alone. I mean, that tells me that, that Jesus was in the secret place. He was there seeking his Father. He was there communing with his Father. You know, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning that he is discovering and finding the dew of his youth. He's, he's learning from the Holy Spirit uh, what the next step is in his mission that the Father has called him to. And he's, he's just step by step, he's, he's recalibrating, reconnecting with the Father. And it struck me as I looked at that passage, you look at the verses just ahead, in fact, nine verses earlier, back in verse verse nine, you have Herod who actually says, King Herod, who's actually asking the question, who is this guy? I beheaded John the Baptist, who's this? So you can tell even from that statement that Jesus is in a, he's in a danger zone. The storm clouds are gathering. Um, There is opposition that's rising. And in this passage, we're going to discover that Jesus actually reveals to his disciples for the first time that the Son of Man is going to to go in some real white water ahead, some real trouble, some real, some real, well, he's going to be killed. And he lays that out for them. So right there in the eye of the storm, here is Jesus in the secret place. And it struck me, it suddenly struck me, I thought, you know, this is the I am of the storm. 
He's the one that's there. All the winds have come, the, the, the clouds are building. There's, you can hear thunder in the distance and lightning flashes. And yet here's Jesus who's there and he's centered in his father and he's waiting for the next, the next step. And he invites his disciples into that when he asks that question. Kind of reminds me, Pastor George, of uh, our text from last week. You have the disciples in a boat and they're in a storm and Jesus is sleeping. So like Jesus, I don't know if, if you want to say that that was, you know, he's in the secret place in that moment. He was asleep <laughs> in, the, in the boat. But um, what, one of the things that stands out to me here is that it says that he was praying alone. So he's in secret place, but it says the disciples were with him. Yeah. And, I, and I, I love the picture of the accessibility of the secret place. Like you ever been in the place where you've been in a crowd, but you're alone, you know, whether you're on a bus riding somewhere, or there's lots of people around you or whatever, but you're like having that time of like intense, you know, reflection or fellowship with God mm -hmm. time or whatever, no matter what is happening around us. And I, I just think it speaks to the reality that even in the middle of chaos, we can still be connected with God and still be in a place of secret. So there he is. Yes, thank you. And there he is with those with his disciples right there. They're watching him pray. And you think about that, Greg. Yeah, they're all around him. They watch him pray. And there maybe there's this, I don't think they interrupt him. I think they see a break. And uh, maybe they were sleeping. It's maybe they were sleeping again. You know that that happened at one point in scripture, right? When yeah, in, in Gethsemane, yes. And also in the Mount of Transfiguration, it happened again. Um, and then Jesus actually is the one who comes out of that prayer, and he asks them a question. Who do the crowd say that I am? Verse 19, they answer, well, they say that you are John the Baptist. But some others say that you're Elijah, and that one of the prophets even of old has risen from the dead. So here they are telling them, well, you, the miracles and what's happening is so powerful. People, are, they, they, don't, they don't have a category for you except to go to the great prophets of the past, including John the Baptist. And then Jesus asks them the pointed question. He says, well, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ of God. And Matthew says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he just goes, boom, that's who you are. Yeah. That you are the one who is that Messiah that we've been looking for, the Messiah we have prayed for. We are in our own time, in our day, we are actually seeing with our own eyes the Messiah. Anything, uh, anything come to your mind when you think about the contrast between those two questions? Who do the crowds say that I am? And who do you say that I am? I think for me, it's so interesting how, you know, curious Jesus is about who, how he, the way that he's known. And, and the contrast to how differently he relates to the circumstances he's in versus how the people around him and the disciples relate to those circumstances. I think that those things kind of interestingly go together that in the same way, Jesus has a different perspective on the circumstances he's in, like the storm, the ability to sleep through a storm the disciples were horrified at. He also has a different perspective on who he is than like who the crowd say he is. Mm. Like, he's, uh, he's in a place of secure identity and like, I don't think he's asking, like sometimes I know in my own life, I've been tempted to ask, you know, well, what are people saying about me? I mean, that's a social media thing too, right? Like, I mean, how often do we go on, you know, or, or, you know, check, check our likes on Instagram or, or whatever, just because we're wondering what people think about what we've put out there about ourselves. And I don't think Jesus was asking that from a place of insecurity, um, but thinking about it from a place of identity, like if we flip the script here on this and say, where am I living? Like, what place am I living in? Am I living from a place where I'm saying, well, what do the crowds say about me? Mm -hmm. Or the real question is, in the secret place, I come into the secret place and I say to my father, who do you say that I am? Like, that question is a question of being secure in our identity and being able to hear from the Lord. And I think that's one of the significant things that we do in the secret place with God, is that we come in daily to the secret place to be, to be restored to our right identity of who God says that we are. There's a ton of opinions out there about who I am, but the only one that really matters is the one that's rooted in the word that God has spoken over my life. Mm. Yes, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
and to hear to hear his declaration of who we are in Christ. And and you look at this, uh, what, what Jesus is doing now is he's also going to he's 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 asking the disciples, "Who do you say that I am?" Peter comes through. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Anointed One. You're the one that we've always been looking for. Jesus is now going to do an, an expectation adjustment with Peter. Because when me, Peter says the word Messiah, that's really something that Peter says that in light of the fact that Jesus is showing no sign yet of leading an uprising against the Romans. Uh, he's, he's, he's healing people. He, he raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. Uh, he, he cast the demoniac out of this, or the demon out of this man who was a demoniac. He uh, raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. I mean, Jesus is doing things. He, he heals the leper. He heals the blind. That's not exactly what Peter saw Messiah to be, but he, he answers it, even though Jesus is not meeting his expectations. He knows that this is the, he's the Messiah. And when he asked that question, Jesus then, in the next verse, in verse 21, does the, ex, the, the adjustment on the expectation. He then said, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. In verse 22, he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This is for Peter. Th this is a bridge too far. There's just no way that Peter, he, he's willing to say, okay, Messiah is going to come and bring healing. He's even going to feed 5,000 in the desert and feed them with five loaves and two fishes. But to say he's going to be killed? Peter's going, no. In fact, it's in Matthew 16 where Peter says, Lord, this will never happen to you. It will never happen to you. And that's when Jesus says to him, you know, Satan, get behind me. He goes, you, you don't have in mind the things of God, but you have in mind the things of man. You're, you're not understanding this picture. Mm -hmm. So Peter, when he asked that, when, when Christ asked Peter that question, when Peter responds with, no, this will never happen to you, we see at that point that Peter wants, what, what, happened, what we're seeing is that Peter wants God to be something else. Mm -hmm. He wants him to be someone other than he is. He wants a Messiah who is going to make, Peter's life plans for his life work out. And he, and he wants to, he, it's like Peter has a plan. We, we talk a lot about how God has a plan for our life, but here we see, you know, Peter's got a plan for Jesus's life. Yeah. And it doesn't line up with what Jesus knows to be true about God's plan for, for Jesus. And so he's, con Peter's suddenly confronted with this reality. Okay. My, my whole world, the way I have it arranged doesn't, there's a different purpose here that I, that I haven't been connected with. I think it's so under, interesting because I think it, I don't think it's just Peter. Like, I think, you know, if we zoom out so much of, um, so many of the Jews had such a similar expectation to Peter that they are going to get a very militant Messiah who came and set them free from their circumstances that it was going to be a very physical and situational freedom that they experienced. And that kind of culturally, their expectation for the Messiah was just really different than the reality of what God was going to do. And, and you can see in their story and in their process, like a lot of disappointment when, it, when they realized that and a lot of confusion. And it's just really interesting, you know, to consider that the people who were waiting for God's first coming, the sending of the Messiah, were so confused about what that was going to look like. And it makes me wonder sometimes, too, especially in this season of life, do I sometimes also confuse my purpose for God with God's purpose? Um, mm. And do I sometimes long for freedom from my situation when God's purpose is a lot higher than that, uh, especially in times of suffering and pain like we encounter with COVID-19 and, and other just difficult circumstances, it, it really feels so personally applicable to us even in this time. Do we fall into that same human trap of expectations that we project onto God that Peter and the Jews did? You were saying you were saying earlier when we were talking about this passage, Annalise, something along the lines of that, you know, we want God to save us from our situation. 
a lot of the times we come and we want our purpose is that God would deliver us out of the situation that we're facing and that God has a different purpose. Yeah. And that so often God is using our situation for his glory to bring us into something greater. Certainly Jesus went through so much suffering, like predicting his death, predicting his crucifixion. It's like the ultimate of shame and suffering in that culture. Um, And would be so difficult to grasp that somebody who you thought was going to be elevated in your time was going to be brought to shame and pain um, for the glory of God. And uh, you can understand why that was such a significant disconnect for him that, that so often God's way is so different than what our expectation for it to be. But in the end, his way results in such a much more beautiful freedom than our expectation. Instead of having physical or situational freedom, what Jesus came for was like freedom of souls and freedom for eternity, not just contextual freedom, ultimate freedom. Yeah. Mm. Good. Let's pick up the text again there. Because after he made this statement, then he, speaking right to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, he says these words, and is in verse 23. He said to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, I mean, you talk about a success statement here, to gain the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself. So here's this, he's made this statement and then he says right to them with all of their dreams and all their hopes of him being Messiah and them, you know, sitting next to him in the throne and the kingdom and all the rest. And he says, if you would come after me, then deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Wow, those are hard words. I wonder what those words would have meant to them at that time. You ever wonder how that landed? Jesus telling them to take up their cross? Like what their understanding of that that would have been? It wasn't, it probably wasn't a pleasant one. (laughs) I mean, there, you know, a cross was for people who were rejected and condemned. And so I'm sure that that, you know, there were, there were times where the disciples said, (laughs) this guy, we don't understand. He talks to us in parables. Like, and they, they came to Jesus and said, you know, you gotta, you gotta explain this. The 12 maybe were on the inside circle because they got to hang out with Jesus after the sermon and really like have him break it down to them. But I'm sure this is one of those sayings that, you know, for them it's, and, and you know what, for us, it's still, it's still a question of like, what does it look like to deny myself and take up my cross? And he's talking about, you know, those words, just as we're reading them here, it's like, whoever loses his life for my sake, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. As you, as we were reading that, I was thinking about like healthcare professionals right now in the middle of this COVID-19 thing, making a decision to get up and go to work, knowing that, you know, there are doctors and nurses who already have lost their lives because they, they encountered, you know, and so you have a real picture of people choosing to serve knowing that it might cost them their lives. And um, so, but for the rest of us, maybe we're not in that situation. And so what does it look like to deny ourselves and take up our cross? I saw this week a video and uh, I, I, had, I, I had a good laugh. It was a man who was being interviewed um, and the interviewer said, um, you, because of COVID-19, you have to quarantine. And so you have two choices. Your choices are A, you can be quarantined with your wife and children or B and the man immediately interrupted him and said, I choose B, B. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, we, that's a lighthearted maybe moment for us to just, to just realize that being, being isolated in our houses right now is an everyday opportunity for us to choose to deny ourselves and to live a life of service. And that may just look like, doing the dishes or taking out the garbage it may look like giving space and when you know putting down a device and actually looking someone in the eyes and giving them the opportunity to just share what they're thinking or feeling or maybe how they're feeling stressed or anxious but we have opportunities and in in the midst of this 
self-isolation, we have opportunities to, to, to make a choice, to deny ourselves and to live for, for others. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can personalize that for your context right now. But I think that um, the current context that we're in is, a, is definitely a, one that offers lots of possibilities for us to live out this reality of yeah. denying ourselves and choosing to take up our cross. And yeah, God may not deliver us immediately from this, the difficulty that we're faced with, but in the midst of it, we can find ways to live out this reality of living for others. Well, thank you for, for pointing that out, Greg, because that really, that does speak to the reality of how to live this out. And, and to, to, to deny myself is number one, to let God be God. And so that I, I give him the throne rather than me, you know, grasping and trying to be that one who's going to say, hey, this is mine, my life, I'm going to run. No, this God, you're God. And I'm going to say yes to you. And then to follow, Jesus says, come follow me, take up the cross and follow me. Love like I love, love in a self-sacrificial way in the way that I have done this. Um, I think of where they're headed. When you look at the Gospels, when you get to this point, when Jesus asked this question, the Caesarea Philippi, it's from that point forward that he then is like an arrow pointed straight toward Jerusalem. Yeah. He's going to head there to that day. And we know that tomorrow, all around the world, is a day that will be remembered as Palm Sunday. Of course, churches all over this country and around the world are closed. I saw even the churches, the church there in Bethlehem uh, is closed for the first time since the Black Plague in the 1400s. Mm. I mean, it's good. But these churches everywhere is closed. But that, that day, that Palm Sunday, was a day when for the disciples, they thought, man, look at this. Jesus is riding on this donkey. He's coming into Jerusalem. Everyone's shouting, Hosanna, son of David. He's here. All of their, that was the, it was the high point. It was the zenith of all their hopes. This is exactly what they had always dreamed would happen. And to have that turn, and by Thursday night at the Last Supper, for Jesus to, to even say to Peter, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. You're all going to scatter. And then go into that, that day that we now call Good Friday, but for them was the darkest day of their lives. And, and then to be there on that, that Sabbath where he rested in the tomb. And then the, the glorious day of resurrection, which was just so stunning they could not believe it. Uh, that's what we want to invite you, congregation, and our, our dear friends in, in Christ here, is that we want to invite you to prepare your hearts uh, this coming week to prepare your hearts. And perhaps that is by joining with this watch party called The Chosen, where people are looking at the story of Jesus together. Perhaps it's by taking a children's storybook with your children and reading the story that leads up from the, from the triumphal entry to, to the cross, to the resurrection. But whatever that is, we're asking and inviting you to actually prepare for next Sabbath, April 11th. But prepare for that day, and perhaps on Friday night, uh, on April 10, perhaps on that Sabbath morning, if you're there with family, gather together, wash one another's feet, ask forgiveness for where we've hurt one another. And then we want you to know that when we come together in our time of worship next Sabbath, that what we'll do is we'll actually celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So we'll come together, and we're even going to send you... Uh, Miranda's already got it together here to put it, send out to you by email a recipe for communion bread. Um, I know Pastor, Bre uh, Pastor Greg, you said that you've been in settings where there was no bread or there was no juice even. Yes, we, you know, as we think about communion around the world, you know, we're in new territory. We've never done a communion service like this one before, no. but it's a, it's a blessing for us to be able to come and take bread and cup and to remember together. And I know thinking about resurrection, resurrection weekend and like not being together uh, at church, that's a big, a big mm. weekend for us. And uh, so when we think about salvation Sabbath to be able to come with bread and cup and, but not to have it be a barrier for anyone. If, if, you know, for instance, if we send out a recipe for communion bread, if that's, if that's not doable for you, then use some bread, use whatever you have available to you. And if you are, are able to have grape juice, that would be amazing. But if not, you know, I've been in places in the world where we've celebrated communion and grape juice was not available. And so you even mentioned, Pastor George, that uh, if, if there's not grape juice available, Jesus said he's the water of life. And 
the, the thing is we want everyone to be able to participate next week. We have the advantage now of being able to plan ahead for a week. And so make preparations this week to be able to celebrate communion together uh, on Salvation Sabbath next, next, next Sabbath. So, so let's, let's close our time together today with, with a question. And really it's the question that when Jesus said, when he said to Peter, he said, and to the others, he said, um, if you, call, if you want to follow me, if you wish to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And the question really for Peter and for all of us is, is will we? Will we say yes to this Jesus? Will we give him our lives? Will we let him use us to be a channel of grace and blessing that his love would flow into this world through us, yeah. starting in our own homes and with those closest to us? Let's pray I together. Say yes. You say yes? yes? I say yes too. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this privilege to be together in the name of Jesus. And again, Lord, we are we're amazed as we think about the decision that you made, Father, Son, and Spirit, to, to, reach, to reach to this world and to bring salvation into this world through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who became one of us and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we are um, just, we're amazed and we are grateful. We thank you for this, this love that has been poured out on our behalf. And on this day, along with Peter and all the apostles and all those who've known Jesus down through the ages, we say yes. We say yes to your call in our lives. Please pour your spirit into our hearts. Help us to be a blessing right where we are now. And Lord, as we look forward to this Salvation Sabbath on April 11, we pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts and show us where it is that uh, the door that you're knocking on, that we would answer that and we would allow you in. There would be no place hidden from you, that you would be all in all in our lives, that the love of Christ would shine into us and bless us and would shine out of us to bless others. So this is our prayer. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Grace and peace in the name of Jesus to you. Amen. God bless you.